How's it going, guys? I'm Connor from Running Warehouse, and we're back at it with another episode of the Running Warehouse Connection. Now, we've been bringing on a lot of amazing ultramarathon athletes over the last couple weeks, and today we're stepping it up one more level. We've got someone who has the most 100-mile wins of all time, five-time champion at the Hard Rock 100, and has set several records at, you know, Appalachian Trail, Pony Express Trail, some amazing treks. We've got Carl Meltzer. Carl, how are you doing today? Doing good, Connor. How are you guys doing? We're doing good. We're doing good. And, you know, we were just talking about, you know, you're a veteran in the sport. You've been winning races for years now. How did this journey all begin? Uh, it all it all began with really one of my buddies saying, let's go ski Big Sky Montana next winter. Well, that's kind of the very early beginning of me moving out west, which turned into a ski bum, which turned into a running bum, if you want to call it that. Uh, I moved out west in 89 to Salt Lake City, Utah and started skiing. Spent on one year of, you know, ski bumming and going back to school and stuff like that. But that didn't really evolve um, once I started running around the mountains. And I'd run when I was younger in high school and stuff too. So I loved running to begin with. I started doing that when I was like 10. But when I started running around the mountains of Utah, it was a, it was a whole new different ball game. You know, wildflowers, big hills, big mountains. Uh, I just loved it. And... You know, I, I jumped into some short races, you know, 17 mile race, um, if you want to call that short, but, uh, you know, some mountain races. And then uh, it evolved into the Pikes Peak Marathon. And that was the biggest race. And then a friend of mine at Snowbird, um, a, a working colleague of mine, I guess, she was a waitress, but her, her husband, name is Rick Gates. He had finished the Wasatch 100 about 10 times at that point. And he said, hey, you should run the Wasatch 100. And I said, why would I want to run 100 miles? <laughs> Um, but he kind of convinced me and I, you know, I thought I trained enough for it and I jumped on the start line, not knowing what salt was for, not knowing really anything about it other than, you know, there were aid stations and, you know, go for it. And, and I went for it and I, I finished the race in 28 and a half, about 28 and a half hours. And, uh, although I didn't want to run another step for the next couple of days, I was ready to sign up after a few more days. And that sort of started the trend of me. Every couple of year, every year it was Wasatch 100, Wasatch 100, but then it evolved into starting traveling around. Sponsorship slowly came on, um, and then I just kind of get hooked on the 100 mile distance. And you know, 25 years later, um, I'm still clicking. I'm a little bit slower than I used to be, <laughs> or a lot slower, but uh, I still enjoy being out there doing it. And uh, you know, I'm probably doing it as long as I can. Yeah. Well, and, and you're known for your race wins. You know, you've been winning year after year, but you're also very well known for your nickname, the Speed Goat. What does that nickname mean, and how did you get it? Well, we got the Speed Goat name from just uh, my buddies and I traveling home from a race, the Pikes Peak Marathon in 92 or 93. And we saw Jack grab across the road, and I just yelled out Speed Goat in a random conversation. Um, a lot of things in my life happen randomly, and that was one of them. And uh, we all, all three of us in the car thought that was a really cool name. And, you know, we didn't know where that was going to go at that point, but we, it was just funny, you know, and my buddy thought he was a speed goat. I thought I was a speed goat. We weren't sure who said it first. A couple of arguments <laughs> went on after that, but uh, it sort of stuck with me a little better than it did with my buddy. So I just kind of branded the name and kind of rolled with it and to see what would happen in the future. And now and here we are 25 years later, about 25 years after seeing that little jackrabbit. Um, I've got a few products, the Hocus, Hocus Speed Goat Shoe, the Ultra Spire Hook Pack, the, or Hoke, I'm sorry, Ultra Spire Speed Goat Pack, um, Dry Max Speed Goat Shoes and Speed Goat Coffee. And it's kind of like a dream world, you know, um, having your, your nickname on something. And, uh, you know, I can't thank my sponsor so much for giving me that opportunity. But yeah, it just came from a random outburst of name <laughs> Um, that I sort of bottled up and saved. Yeah, now I, I want to get into some of your favorite products, uh, specifically the Speed Goat stuff a little bit later, but can you tell us also about uh, the Speed Goat race? Um, I know that that's, you know, a, a big part of, you know, what you do. Yeah, the Speed Goat race, uh, we started, it's, it's gone now for 14 years, um, and time sure does fly to think it's been 14 years, but uh, that kind of happened you know, I never thought I'd be a race director either, um, but I'd worked in the restaurant business a long time and I've worked in events a little bit up at Snowbird. So I sort of knew after racing for a bunch of years, I sort of knew the gist of how to do it. So the, the event director at Snowbird at the time 
sat down at my bar. I was a bartender at Snowbird and he said, Hey, do you think you could get, you think about having a race up here? And I was like, well, I didn't really think about it. He's like, you think you get a hundred runners here, uh, you know, in this, this summer. And I was like, I could easily get a hundred runners here. And that was 2000, I think it was 2007. And, uh, we had 112, you know, we kind of put it out there. We had this conversation in March. So we only had a couple months to really get it going. But a lot of people knew me at the time and locally. And my goal wasn't to put on a, a, an easy race because I train on hard terrain. If anyone's ever been to the Wasatch Front, it's steep and rocky and pretty tough, you know. So I wanted it to be sort of my terrain, uh, which was a lot at the time was probably the toughest hundred or not toughest, toughest 50K in the US. And I still kind of claim that, but there's other races that are hard too. We don't, we don't include Barkley, that's different. Um, but at the same time, I wanted to make a hard race that people would come back to and people that would really get uh, hammered by it, really worked over, you know? And so we put a course together in 2007 and uh, we got 112 runners on the start line, which was, our goal was 100, so we achieved that. Uh, the course was a mess, people got lost, it was, <laughs> it was a, it was a mess, but at the same time, we've, you know, over the years, we've made it better and better. And now, because I was a, one of the top level competitors at that time, it wasn't really that hard for me to ask some of my buddies I raced against to come to the race to make it competitive. And that, that actually happened pretty easily. And, uh, you know, now we just have a good competitive, tough race um, that people love to come back to. It becomes sort of a bucket list race for some people because it is so hard that they do it once and they're like, okay, I'm done with that. <laughs> so, so maybe I made it a little too tough for some, but uh, it's really worked out great. Snowbird has been a great supporter of me. Hoka has been the title sponsor for a, a number of years now. And uh, we've given out prize money and I'm trying to, you know, trying to just support the, the sport of ultra running, giving back to it a little bit because my competitive years at, at the very top of the field are, are I'm not gonna say they're over, but they're close to over, you know, and that's okay. Um, but it's cool to get back and watch the younger fast guys challenge themselves on a course that I would prefer to see them really race on, you know, not just the, um, the smooth buttery single track, California single tracks, what I call it. <laughs> um, instead make it hard, you know, and make people suffer and make it a 50 K that five hours is still unbroken. And there aren't many 50 Ks where the record is under is over five hours. So, and it's Walmsley's that was the record. So, um, it's cool to have a tough course and it's great to have the support of all the local people as well. And, Volunteers are easy. No, I'm not going to say it's easy to get volunteers, but we've turned people away every year to volunteer because we have too many. And I mean, that's, that's priceless, you know, to have that support. Um, it's been a great ride. It's amazing. It's been 14 years, but I'm, I'll put it on as long as I can. Uh, you know, and that's definitely a few more years in the books. So uh, if you guys haven't run it yet, you know, now's the chance <laughs> to come do it. Um, it's been a great ride. Yeah, and I mean, you talk about it being so challenging and you've done so many ultras over the years, so you obviously know what's hard and, you know, it sounds like Speed Goats up there is one of the toughest. Uh, in your experience, what is your favorite ultra? It sounds like you like the harder courses. Uh, what's been your favorite ultra over the years? Um, that's, that's a common question. That's a hard question for me to answer, you know, because as, I mean, it's easy for me to say Hard Rock's my favorite, right? Because I've won it five times, it's tough. As I've gotten older, I don't necessarily want the hard rock course for my next 100 miler <laughs> because it's really hard. I mean, I was better at the harder, tougher, higher altitude stuff when I was younger. I mean, hard rock is pretty, sp it's pretty spectacular for a course. It's, the high altitude is pretty, pretty tough to beat anywhere in the US. Um, it's just up high like that. That's probably my, it probably is my favorite race really. But I mean, there's a lot of races that are great. Wasatch was great, Bears great, Massanutten 100 in Virginia is great. They're all different, you know, um, the way the courses are, but they all present a different type of challenge. So for me, to say one race is really my super favorite is kind of tough. I just like courses that are, they're challenging, they're in the woods, you know, they have some technicality for, to it. I mean, if it's not technical for me, I even in my best years, I really don't have a chance to win. I'm more of a, I need the rocks and the junk uh, for me to do well because that's what I train on. And uh, but you know, Zane Gray 50 is a great course. Was a great course. It's changed now a little bit, but I just like the races that challenge people to their limit, but don't necessarily um, kill you unless it's speed goat. <laughs> um, it's just you know, like for me, like a race like Barkley is a little over the top as far as difficult because that's more difficult than Hard Rock for sure. 
just because it's a little bit more orienteering. It's a little bit more just kind of just a mess. Um, I like a race that's runnable. Um, hard, and I, I'd call hard rock runnable. The trails are actually pretty good. You're just up high and, you know, technical. Um, UTMB is great. Um, when I first ran UTMB, it was in the, there was still a thousand something people in the race, 2000, but it was still in the early phases of that event. And, and I had a chance to win that race in 2000. I think it was seven, six or seven. Um, and I didn't, I actually dropped out, but, uh, that was my chance. <laughs> Um, that is really a spectacular course, and I know that that's so popular now, it's hard to get into, but the, the majestic helps are, are bigger than hard rock, you know. Um, I've only run UTMB in Europe, so I really can't speak for too many of those races, but if I were to change my strategy of where to run, it'd probably be Europe, <laughs> because the mountains are, the mountains aren't really higher, they're just, but they're bigger, they're just, the valleys are lower, so the climbs are bigger and they're tougher. Um, you know, Wasatch was the first one that I ever ran, first 100. It's first ultra, really, actually, I ever ran. Jumped right in the 100 miler. Might be the last one I ever run. You know, that would be kind of like a point to point career, right? As, as Hard Rock is, or Wasatch is a point to point course. So there's a lot of great races out there, you know. Um, but those are the few I mentioned that are, were really pretty true that I really liked. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've ran so many races now, it's probably hard to keep track of all of them, but are there any major races that you haven't gotten to yet that you'd still like to check off before you uh, you stop running ultras? Uh, there's a few races I haven't done. Uh, I was supposed to run Superior 100 this year, which was last weekend, would have been last weekend. It's up on Lake Superior, it's point to point on Superior Hiking Trail. Again, it's technical, it's hilly. You know, it's not big mountain hilly, but it's technical all the time. That would be a good race for me, and I've always wanted to go there. Uh, I've just never made it because something else was um, in the way or some other race was being run at that time for me. Uh, the other stuff, AC, Angeles Crest is another 100. Um, hopefully that one isn't burned apart right now, unfortunately. Um, Cascade Crest 100 is another classic one. I Am Tough 100. When I, see, when I started running 100s, there were about 27 of them in the U.S. Now there's like 327 of them. You know, um, what I really seek out though is a good course. In four weeks, I'm running the No Business 100 in Tennessee and Kentucky, right? And some would think like, why are you going there? But it's a, it's a loop course. It's all, it's just about a single track and it's in the woods. And for me now, that's, that's what I crave kind of, you know, I'm from the East Coast. So I love to run in the woods back then. And here in Utah or Colorado or places out West California, the woods aren't really the same as they are in the East Coast. It's just, they're just more dense there. It's like more hardwood foresty. So, you know, I mean, there's, it's hard saying, but those three that I mentioned are, are three that I'd like to check off. Um, but hey, if I don't make it to them, it's not, you know, I'm not going to like crawl in a hole. It's not the end of the world. Yeah. Well, we, we talk about all your 100 mile wins. You've got more than anyone. You've got the experience, but things obviously don't go right, you know, every single race. Um, what do you think's the craziest thing that's ever happened to you during, uh, you know, an ultra marathon race? Well, if you haven't heard the moose story, uh, Bighorn, then that's easily the craziest thing that's happened to me in a race. And, uh, briefly for the, those folks listening out there, if you haven't heard it, you can just Google Carl Meltzer moose story <laughs> and you'll, and you'll be able to read a more detailed description. But I was charged by a moose, kicked by a moose played cat and mouse behind a tree with the moose uh, until she finally went away and then charged me again. And then I did the same thing again. And uh, it was pretty scary. Um, I was leading the race at the time. It was near the turnaround of the Bighorn 100 um, up in uh, Sheridan, Wyoming. And, uh, you know, I got away with actually winning the race um, that day. Uh, I beat Nick Clark by about 30 minutes or something. But that was pretty scary. I mean, it was just getting dark when that happened. And you see the seven foot animal charging after you and then you start running top speed after running 49 miles when you're when you're you know you're pretty sore at that point already you, you find that top gear to dive into the bushes behind the tree um that was pretty intense i mean that was definitely one of the most intense things i mean the weather we had at utmb one year when they canceled it at 18 miles was also really intense uh thunderstorms rock slides you know, not quite as intense as a moose, maybe, but that was pretty gnarly. Um, 
you know, it's hard to mention all those all those times, but there's been a lot of thunderstorms in hard rock that that are pretty gnarly, that kind of scare you, make you want to hide under under a, under a rock or something. But where there are no trees, <laughs> not the trees are good, they're bad. But uh, you know, the moose story. Google Google Carl Meltzer moose story, and you'll get a good in depth uh, description of what really happened out there. That was crazy. Wow. Yeah. No, that is crazy. And like you hear about, yeah, like so something like an animal or weather, and that's things that are kind of physical things from the outside that you can't really control. But let's go back. I, I know we've talked with several ultra marathon athletes and everyone seems to have their own like hallucination story where they kind of push their body. They maybe are a little dehydrated um, and they hallucinate out on the trail. Has, has that ever happened to you during a race? You know, I don't, I don't recall ever really hallucinating on a trail. Um, I've heard, like you said, I've heard many stories of people saying, Oh my God, I was hallucinating. I've seen things. And you know, maybe, I've certainly seen a stump thinking it was a bear. Okay. Now when it's dark and you're by yourself, cause I don't run with patrons or others at night. I'm a, I'm all game with going out there by myself and making it happen on, alone. So I've certainly seen images in the dark that were, whoa, Hey, what's that? You know, or, you know, that same time at, at Bighorn, that same year where I had the moose attack or moose uh, charging, I heard an elk ran in front of me 20 miles later like right in front of me, booted, 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 you know, like 20 of them. And that freaked me out. You know, uh, they call it one wild and they called it one wild and scenic and it's pretty wild and scenic. Um, it's, it's a scary time out there by yourself, you know, but it's, you just got to take it with a grain of salt and deal with it. I mean, it's just the woods, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you keep seeming to push it further and further and a hundred mile race for you now is just, you know, it's nothing. Um, what is the farthest uh, race distance you've done, and will you consider going further in the future? <laughs> um, well, the 100-mile race is the furthest technical race I've done. I mean, you probably know about the Appalachian Trail. That's not a race. It's an, it's an FKT thing. It's 45 days of 50 miles a day. That's a journey uh, more than it is. A, I mean, certainly trying to you know, run the fastest time on that is a, uh, is a race sort of, but that's the journey. Um, but I do, I am on the list for the Cocodona 250 in Arizona in next May. I'm not really a hundred percent sure I'm going to run it. I'm not, I'm not sitting here now focused and training for that, but um, it, it, it intimidates me a little bit because I'm don't do very well with sleep deprivation. When I get really, really sleepy and sleep monsters on my back and I just want to crawl into, you know, into the bushes or into bed or something, I'd rather go to sleep. So that one will challenge me above and beyond anything that I've been challenged on, even more in a different sense than the Appalachian Trail. Because with the AT, I have this amazing support crew with my dad and Eric and my wife and, and a few others that join me. But you have this van to sleep in every night and you have that comfort of like a home every night, you know. At Cocodona, I think that's really going to be different for me because, yeah, there's sleep stations there, there's crew, but it's kind of one push. The Appalachian Trail was 45 pushes of each day. You know, it was, it's very different. Um, you know, people ask me how I trained for the AT, and it was like, I didn't really do anything different. You know, I just prepared my crew to be ready for anything. I trained my crew. I didn't really tell them what to do, but, I mean, I scoped out the whole entire Appalachian Trail in my car to check all the points where they can see me. I did that. It took me like a month to drive the whole length of it. And I did a lot of that stuff. That's how I prepared for the 2,200 miles. Um, how I'm going to prepare for the 250 in Cocodona, if I do start it, will be, won't be much different than I'm preparing now. Um, I just hope to like muscle through it and kind of laugh at the low points that I know I'm going to have. Um, and that's what I've learned about hundreds too, is that, you know, I, I say it's not that far and I don't believe it is really that far. But I didn't say it didn't hurt, you know. Um, it hurts every time. So you have to expect it to hurt. And when it does hurt a lot, you have to sort of shrug off that aches and pain and, and suck it up and, and deal with it. And uh, I've learned how to do that very well. Uh, no business in four weeks. I'm, I don't see myself as in 100% tip-top tip -top form to run the race. But as far as finishing the thing, unless, you know, injuries are, are one thing, but like real injuries, but aches and pains aren't going to stop me from finishing. Um, I, it's one day, you know, and people have to look at it as one, one push. It'll be over in 24 hours. Anyone that's dropped out of a hundred mile or knows, and me included that, you know, when you drop out the next day, you're like, uh, why did I drop out? Cause you're walking around having breakfast, you know, with your friends and it, you feel kind of like, 
you have this low point and uh yeah. it's it's under junk that far um it's not that it's not that hard to finish it if you really want it but you have to want it you know if you when you when you're standing on the start line with doubts then you know you're putting yourself in the hole already you know you gotta you gotta get on the start line and, and be eager and be like okay this is going to be fun but it's going to hurt yeah well, and you talk about these journeys like the Appalachian Trail, Pony Express Trail. Those were obviously like crazy events. A lot of planning went into that. Do you see doing something like that in the future? Um, and like, what is the limit for, you know, how far you can kind of push your body on one of those, you know, long journeys? Yeah. So the Appalachian Trail, so I've done the AT three times, um, you know, 2008, 2014, I dropped after about 1500 miles because I was off pace and I was the guy funding the whole thing. So I was like, well, you know, I'm out. Um, I regret that just like I would if I dropped out of a race. You know, I, I could have finished the AT that time, but I didn't want to. And I went home with the tail between my legs. Um, I don't see myself going after chasing a record that big anymore because I'm, I'm kind of past, I'm definitely past my peak age of speed, you know, being 52. I could endure the AT and I could endure it probably under 50 days, but the record is now 41 days and seven hours. And I, you know, for me to chase that is probably, there's no way I would get that. It's Karel Saab is, you know, he's 29 years old. He was a lot younger. That definitely helps. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't see myself really chasing a record that long. Right now I'm more like into the journey of just doing things that I want to do that aren't as hard. <laughs> um, I do hope to hike the whole AT northbound uh, with my wife in a few years um, but like a normal person 13 15 miles a day or you just walk and you hang out with people and um you, know, you also enjoy the solitude of just being in the woods that's a journey i mean last last summer i did the long trail with eric bells the guy the crew guy in the made to be broken movie guy with the beard for those people i haven't seen it but uh we did it was 19 days on the long trail and the long trail is it's similar to new hampshire and maine in terms of difficulty it's really hard in New England, the, the Appalachian Trail. It's harder than anything in the West. Don't kid yourself. If you think anything in California or Colorado or Utah is harder, it's not. Um, it's just more technical and funky. Uh, but that was 19 days, and I got a little gist of, like, what it feels like to be a through hiker. Yeah, resupply of towns and things like that, and that was really, really cool. I had such a great time because there was no pressure to go, just go hard. You know? Carrying, you know, a 20-pound pack. Which is a light pack, but that's all we carried because we learned how to slim everything down. And to me, that was part of the fun challenge of doing it. Um, so I see myself doing more stuff like that instead of really challenging, really fast tough FKTs. Um, people, the FKTs now that people are breaking, we've seen it all summer. Um, I look back and they're just off the charts. You know, the Wonderland Trail in in uh, around Rainier, that record is now 16 hours and something, and that's. I mean, I have not done that trail, but I know many who have, and that is a sick record. You know, I can't chase that record. I'm not going to break that, so I'll stay away from that one. I would like to do the trail, but I see myself more doing just more enjoyable journeys than, than trying to break times. Yeah. Well, and you talk about these fast records being, you know, taken, and we we talk about, like, a lot of these younger ultramarathon athletes that are kind of bringing up the sport what are your thoughts on these younger athletes and how does it kind of compare to, you know, your younger days when you were um, racing? Well, it's interesting because I, I read my first ultra, which is Wasatch. I said, I was 29 years old. Okay. So I was 29. Um, there was a comment on Facebook by Andy Jones Wilkins the other day. They said, I can't believe Dakota Jones is still in his twenties. So Dakota is super fast. If you don't know Dakota, look up his name. He's a super fast young kid. I was offering him beer when he was 18 in Moab because I thought he was 21 <laughs> after the race. I'm like, he's 18, you know? Um, so you get younger, Kikilmi Jornet was like 20 or 19 or something when he started running really, you know, UTMB fast. They're starting younger. And, and many people say, well, how long do you think they're going to last? What's their longevity? Carl, you've lasted 25 years or so. Um, I'm like, you know, it's, it's yet to be determined whether Kikilmi Jornet or, or Dakota Jones or, you know, guys that started in their early 20s, Jared Hazen, super fast. Um, will they be still running like Carl when they're 50? And we don't know that, you know, we don't really know that yet. Um, that would be me saying I started when I was 30 and I'm still running well when I'm 60. The answer, my answer to that is like probably not that fast, you know, when I'm 60. Uh, it's hard to really say. I mean, Wamsley's been around for 
six, seven years, you know, um, and for the most, the life of a really fast ultra runner, that's generally the lifespan, you know, um, but we'll see. I mean, we'll see how long Jim takes it. We'll see how long Jared takes it and killing him. I mean, he's been going 10 or 12 years. It's really hard to say. Um, they're definitely faster because they're younger though. I mean, that's, you see it in golf, you know, the guys that are, the guys that come out of this sport really young, they're shooting these amazing scores and they turn 30 and we think that they're old, but they're 30, <laughs> you know, um, and they're not beating the young 20 year olds again. And I don't know if that's because of their vision or because of the runner's ability, because they're younger, their VO2 max is higher. Their bodies are just fresher. Uh, they recover a lot faster. I think the recovery thing is the, is the, the biggest difference because the 20 year olds is going to recover faster than the 30 year olds, you know, and forties and fifties and whatever. So what we're seeing right now is a whole change from also from road runners, guys that were really fast on a track that are coming into ultras. I mean, Jim's and, and Hayden Hawks and those guys have all run under 14 for 5k. Tim Tollison's real close to that time. And that's my best 5k it was 16, 20. It wasn't even remotely close to what those guys have done. So if you think about it, what they should be doing when they're running ultras is running as fast as they are now. Hard Rock in 23 hours, you know. When I ran Hard Rock in 26.39 in 2001, no one was ever going to break that record. No, that's unbeatable. And it's four hours faster now, you know, four hours, like 20%. So it's, 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 it's cool to see the young kids. I love to see them break records like that. Uh, I think we're going to see it again when these younger kids that were 20 and then when they're 40, there's going to be another batch of kids that come up and they're going to, there's going to be another killing journey. It's going to be killing styles. It's just reality. Basketball players are bigger and stronger than they ever were. Right. Football players are the refrigerator was 300 pounds. When I was a kid, that was like, I was massive. They're all 350 now. Right. So it just changes. So everybody gets bigger and stronger. And I think it's, it's just the world as it evolves. And uh, I love to see it. I mean, I, when my record went down on the AT, when string beam beat my time, self-supported, I was rooting for him. It wasn't like I was like, oh, man, I'm going to lose a record. You know, I wasn't bummed out about that. I wanted to be there for to see it, you know. I, I like to see people push limits. And uh, and now what Carell's done, you know, that's a whole other, like, level. But he did it because he, he, was, he was just more efficient the way he slept on the trail more and stuff. So we're just going to keep seeing it evolving and getting better. And there's no reason we can't cheer for it. It's stupid to sit back and be bummed about, you know, records that get broken. Uh, records are made to be broken, you know, that's why the film was called that, um, I think, but uh, I love it. I love to see kids killing it. I love to see them, I love to see them um, go out hard and blow up too, because they're, because that's where really fast records come from. They're going to fail a couple times too, and I think they know that, but they're pushing the limits more than we did too. We never went out fast at Hard Rock. Uh, we just kind of like stayed together the first 20 miles, you know, we were moving all right, but we weren't we weren't running that fast. Nowadays, give you an example, at when I ran 2639 in 2001, why I remember these numbers, I don't know, but I was two hours and 54 minutes at a place called KT, 12 miles into the race. Nowadays, when Hard Rock is running that direction, the leaders are going through there in 220. 35 minutes faster. I mean, that's a lot, you know? And so we're seeing everybody push the limits early to, to, to finish faster at the end. and. Whether they blow up more is one thing, but the wrecks are just going to keep coming down when they keep doing that. Someone's going to bust it eventually. You know, it just yeah. takes time. It takes a little practice. Yeah, and I think as the sport continues to grow, you know, like you said, even 20 years ago, it's changed so much. Um, we're going to continue to see those times go, and, you know, the younger athletes are going to keep pushing the limits. But like you said, your kind of elite faster days are starting to get behind you. Um, but I know you do still coach athletes. Um, can you talk about kind of – what you've learned and, and what you do preach as a coach? Well, I mean, I'm not a data person. I mean, I'm a data person, but I'm not a, a gadget. I guess a gadget person is really more of my thing. Cause you know, I'm, I'm sort of old school. I'm 52. So when I had my watch, I had my Casio watch and it told time. You know, this, I was lucky I had a stopwatch on it and a light. Right. So I've sort of learned by not using the gadgets, whether it's, I mean, Strava is not really a gadget. It just gives you information, but, you can train on the gadget and you can not train on the gadget. And I like to train my athletes to learn how to listen to their body to really get the most out of it. And that comes with a training plan. That's it's, it's very actually pretty simple, but at the same time, I like to give advice on how to, how they can manage their bodies and, and get the most out of what they have. You know, if you're a, a four hour marathoner, you're probably not going to get down to two thirty, right? That's just, 
don't kid, don't kid yourself. It's the reality. I was never a fast marathoner, you know. Um, but I like to teach them to try to get the most out of their bodies. And and some of the times it's trying to tell them to back off the amount of volume that they're doing, or sometimes it needs well, you know, 30 miles a week probably isn't going to cut it to run hundreds. You got to at least get that up to 50. You know, you get a good consistent base going so you have that um, that base. And then then a lot of it then after 40 miles or 30 miles and 100, it all comes in, it's all in your head anyway. You know, a lot of people don't understand that uh, until they do it. And once they do it once, it's like, yeah, I dropped out. I shouldn't have dropped out. But it's to teaching them to learn it mentally and efficiently and how to get the most out of the bodies is what I try to preach the most, as opposed to looking at your, um, your heart rate, your data, your pace. I mean, if you're training in the mountains, pace is very much dictated by the terrain. You can't, you know, I ran 12 and a half minute miles the other day and you're like, oh God, that's slow. Well, I had 4,000 feet of climb in 12 miles. Well, that's pretty fast. It's all about, you know, getting the most out of their bodies and, uh, and training for specifically for doing a run technical race, you train on technical terrain. You don't run Leadville if you're from Tallahassee. You know, it's just like it's, or it's not smart, you can try. Um, I just try to teach them to run most efficiently and try to get the most out of themselves. And encourage yeah. them, you know, encouragement is a big thing too, of course. Of course, yeah. I mean, that's that's half the battle right there. Um, but you you talk about how you're not a huge tech guy. You know, um, you're kind of old school. You talk about the Casio. But um, what gear are you bringing out on race day? I know you've got um, some pack favorites. Do you have you upgraded to a GPS watch yet? <laughs> well, I <laughs> I do have my wife's Garmin here, but it is her watch. I didn't buy it. <laughs> Uh, she had to buy another one, but um, I do use a GPS watch when I run. I track my distance and my, and my vertical gain, but I don't really get really technical. I mean, I could run around the Wasatch all day long and tell you how much I climbed without a watch on. I know it so well, you know. Um, but when I go further, when I go uh, places I don't know, yeah, I track my distance. But that's not. Um, it's not really a high major priority. Uh, I'm not tracking my heart rate monitor on it. I know when I'm sucking wind, and I know when I'm not. <laughs> Um, so I know when to back off the throttle and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not on Strava. I had a hard time connecting with that. So for some reason I'm technologically challenged. It never seems to happen for me. <laughs> so I kind of give up easy. Um, I have a short uh, attention span sort of, uh, sometimes. So I, mean, I use the gadget a little bit, but generally speaking, um, the gear that I use, whether it's my running pack or my shoes or, However, I'm, you know, whatever I've got on me, um, it's usually probably the most efficient way to carry stuff. And that also translates to faster times because if, if you look at a, you know, you talk about gear, let's talk about a waist pack first. It's, I mean, I, most people have vests nowadays, right? I mean, 90% of people seem like they wear the vest and they like the vest and there's nothing wrong with the vest. But people that wear vests in, in most cases are carrying more stuff than they need because they have that capacity. Right. So I, I can stuff a few more gels in here. Or I can stuff, uh, you know, my, my phone charger and my phone in here. And I don't, I don't carry my phone when I run ever, ever. I don't take pictures out there because I don't want to carry the weight. So I carry just barely enough stuff to get me from point A to point B. And if I sort of run out of my stuff, like, like food, you know, for instance, then I was, I slow down and I, I get there. I mean, I'm going to get there. I'm not going to pass out on the trail. I hope. Right. Um, but efficiency for me has been uh, a real ticket to success because the one year, an, an example of that would be at Hard Rock where one year, the year that I did win, I had 16 minutes of total downtime through Hard Rock, 16 minutes. The next guy closest to me was like 54. So that's like giving me a 40 minute head start, right? So I just kind of maximized my, my efficiency better than anyone initially. I mean, guys are better now, but back in the day, it was just like, why am I stopping? You know, I can keep moving forward. And uh, so I, when I created the, the pack and, and the shoes and everything else, it was just like, how can I make this most efficient? I mean, sometimes I, I run like a yard sale. <laughs> um, if I got to carry a shirt, I tie it around my waist. I don't stuff it in the back of my pack where I got to take it off. I got to fill my bladder and I got to do all this stuff. I come into an aid station, I fill my bottle, I leave. So it's, it's much faster and efficient now. And I'm just trying to like master that and you know, I'll, I know I'm going to see it in four weeks where I'll come to an aid station behind someone and they'll be standing there and I'll go right by them and then they'll have to catch up to me again. So yeah. I just, I just try to get the most out of uh, what I've got left, you know, in a lot of different ways. Yeah. And I mean, you're, it sounds like you're one of the most efficient runners on the trail, but 
you do carry some gear with you. Um, what is your, your pack of choice to kind of bring you, your fuel? Well, so I mentioned I wear a little waist pack, and I always have. Uh, I have had a vest on the AT a little bit in longer sections. I kind of needed that then. But uh, I have the Speedgoat 3.0 from Ultraspire pack, and I work with Bryce Thatcher developing that. And what's really unique about that pack that no one else on the market has is uh, it's it attaches on the right and the left hand side. So when you tighten it, instead of having that simple belt, you know, belt buckle in the middle type thing, where it always seems to cinch on everybody's belly button, and a lot of people will say they can't, you know, it's too tight on the belly, they can't they can keep their food down, it's too tough. Well, this this pack tightens on each side, right on the, right on your pelvic crest, right on the top of your bone there. So when you tighten it, you pull forward, which your hands are running like this, right? So you, you're, they're basically right at your fingertips. So if you need to tighten it, if it did slip at all, this pack hasn't slipped on me at all yet, but it's right in front of your, right in front of you. Um, and then it has a real wide pouch. Now it's about three, three, I don't know, three and a half, three inches wide, three and a half inches wide. That goes around your sort of around little, below your belly button. And because it's wider, it doesn't cinch on you again, you know? So it, it just kind of sits on your body. The, the bottles angle out in the back a little bit. A lot of packs have done that. Um, and that's a great idea. Our, our bottles are not the standard ground bottles. They're kind of flatter, they're softer. So they, um, the water flow is really strong. Uh, it's really easy to drink out of, it's easy to refill. Um, it's fast. Um, the bottles don't pop out because the, the way this is, this is angled a little bit. Here's the bottle. We'll see if when this goes in like this, it's angled just a little bit. So you really can't, pull it out, like it's hard to pull out. All you do is you, from the bottom, you pop it up like this when you're running and it comes right out. But this way it stays in, you know, if you crash. There's a lot of little things about this that there's a little tiny pocket in the back um, next to your water bottle that can two gels each. Um, simple thing in the back for a, for a, like a, a super, super light wind jacket. And then the front pouch looks like this. It's simple pouch in the front, stretchy like that. It'll fit your phone if you need to carry your phone. Um, and then the belt, when it hooks on, um, there's a little hook like this right here. So when for easy on and off, it's just, just do this little hook like that and you're on. And, and like I said, to pull it forward, it's like you pull forward like this to tighten it. It's, it's awesome. Um, and now Ultraspire has a light attachment that goes on your waist onto this pack, which is even like, a hundred times better with a waist light. So that's a whole nother story behind this, but um, this thing is really light, it weighs nothing. And I can carry enough uh, fuel on this pack for there's uh, two 18 ounce bottles with so 36 ounces of fluid, which is always good for two hours. Um, it's about a two hour, two and a half hour pack. You know, we didn't design it to carry all day long um, with nothing, but that's, that's what I wanted to do. And Bryce stuck with me on that. And now we're selling out of them like hotcakes. Um, I hope people like them, you know, it's, it's, it's different than what they're used to with the vests, but they're so, so much more efficient than a, than a vest actually is. And a vest can be hot. These certainly aren't hot because there's nothing on your chest, you know. Yeah. Uh, how, how important is fueling for you and, and has that changed over the years? Because it seems like you're very efficient, you're in and out of, uh, of these checkpoints. Um, yeah, how, how important is fueling for you? Well, it's certainly important, important to fuel, but there's, there's fine lines of drinking too much or eating too much or whatever. I mean, I have a simple formula and, you know, temperature matters, but, um, you know, if you sit my formula anyway, it's, it obviously varies, but if you're, it's 70 degrees, I'm good for like one uh, salt stick cap, which is about 360 milligrams of sodium. And I only drink water in my bottles. I typically won't put anything else but water. That way I know um, I can gauge my calories a lot better. Um, you know, I treat my, treat my food like an IV drip. I typically will run with single serve gels uh, because I can monitor how much I'm taking in one every like 20, ideally every like 24 minutes uh, is right. I mean, I'm not perfect with that when I'm out there running because you forget time sometimes, but I try to keep that right about then. Uh, and that's really, that's really about it. If I come to an aid station, I might drink some, I drink a little soda sometimes, sometimes Red Bull, sometimes Coca-Cola. Uh, even Gatorade. I've had Gatorade before. So sometimes cold Gatorade just tastes good, you know, but I really keep the calories coming in with me with an IV drip about 250 per hour. And then, uh, you know, fluid kind of depends, but remember fluid is, 
it can, it can hurt you in a, in, a, in a real hot race like Western States because if you're thinking that you're going to drink 40 or 50 ounces of water every hour because it's hot, pouring water in your body, in my opinion, doesn't really cool you. It keeps you hydrated. But you can keep yourself cool by pouring water over your head a little bit better, you know? So you have to use external cooling when it's really hot out too, as opposed to just drinking too much. And a lot of people's problems is they drink too much when it's hot. And then they have, they get nauseous, they can have a potentially hyponatremia, which is rare, but it happens. Um, you gotta know how to manage yourself and that comes with practice. And, you know, I've run 7,500, so I know how to do it. Um, so I try to preach that on to my coaching clients too, is that, you know, it's all different for everybody. Um, but here's the general formula. You run a few races, you sort of figure yourself out and then you'll get it, you know? Uh, and then usually they can take it on their own and not even worry about like how their feeling is. Uh, it's it's hard to really say do this and it's going to work for you perfectly. That just any coach will tell you that's not that's not true all the time. It might work once in a while for someone perfectly, but generally speaking, you've got to you've got to tweak it a little bit and, and mess around with it a little bit to get it right. And I just you know, I, I kind of race on the minimum. Um, you know, hundred miler is not a buffet. <laughs> um, a lot of people eat they eat too much too, and they they get over bloated because they're trying to eat too much early and then they have this, this belly that they can't process any food because there's just too much in there. It doesn't go down the funnel, you know? Um, and if you go to Leadville, the higher altitude it is, whether it's Hard Rock the highest or Leadville or Silver Hills or something like that, um, your body isn't going to process food as easily that way either at that altitude. So that's another factor you throw into the, nor another wrench into the engine, right? And you have to figure that out on your own a lot of times and just try to take suggestions from whoever your coach is to try to get it right. And just, uh, Hopefully it works for you. But once you get it right the one time, you just kind of go back and look and say, well, what did I do this time? And then you sort of make your little notes and then, you know, you'll remember after a while what usually works for you and what doesn't. Yeah. Gels are good for you. You know, a lot of people, sorry, I butt in last time, but many people think gels, I can't eat any more gels. They're messing with my stomach. Well, gel doesn't mess with your stomach. It's, <laughs> gels are made for, for fast fuel, right? It's, it's either probably eating too many of them or you're overhydrated or the or the balance isn't right somewhere. It's not the gel. It's not the, it's not really the food that you're putting in. It's the amount, I think anyway, that you're, that you're putting in and how it's digesting. It's a tough one, you know, it's hard to really get that right. Yeah. Nutrition's tricky and it, it seems like it does just take lots of practice and, you know, someone like you, your experience, you, you've got it down, but for a lot of people, it's just going to take getting out there and, you know, on training runs or a race day, figuring out what's going to be ideal for your own personal preferences. But nutrition is kind of only one piece of the puzzle. Another big piece is your footwear of choice. Um, what has been your go-to shoe uh, for training and then on race day? Yeah, well, I mean, many people know the Spiegel shoe I helped uh, with Hoka and collaborated on building that shoe. So that certainly is my favorite shoe now. But just stepping back to the beginning of my career is where it really started. Um, I was first running in, this is a long time ago for many people that don't, probably weren't even born yet, but first it was the Nike Territor, which was a little trail running shoe that, um, it has a little more beef, but it was pretty soft. It was gen generally speaking, it was pretty soft, okay? And then it went to the Montreal Vitesse, which was even softer, a kind of a, it had a fatter sole, um, not like Hoka's are yet, but it had a fatter sole, a little bit wider, a little more room in the toes, and I loved that shoe. A lot of people, I would be willing to bet I could find people that still have boxes of those shoes in their closet because they bought 40 pair when they were going to stop making them. I'm not kidding. I know a few people in Virginia that still have new ones. I loved them. Um, but then my relationship with, Hope, with uh, Montreal ended um, for whatever reason. And then I, then I went to La Sportiva and their shoes were okay uh, at the time. Uh, Hoka didn't even exist then. But La Sportiva... Um, they had a shoe called the Fireblade. It wasn't, it was comfortable, um, wasn't super soft, but it was kind of the best at the moment. There wasn't anything out there that I really loved because they stopped making that Montreal test. And I was like, oh my God, what am I gonna run now? And then, and then in 2009, after I had run UTMB the first time, I ran against a guy named Nico Mermud. And some of you know that uh, he's the founder, one of the two founders of Hoka. He called me on the phone and said, hey, Kyle, I had something to show you. I'd like to show you these shoes. And he was in Salt Lake. He's familiar with Salt Lake pretty well uh, from skiing. And he, I'm like, sure, bring over the bag. You know, so he brought over the bag. And 
and he pulled out those first pair of Mafades, which I still have um, in my basement, and they're they're classics. <laughs> um, you know, I was like, what the hell are those things? But I tried them on. I'm like, all right, what the hell? I wasn't really psyched with the Sportivas because they really weren't that big soft shoe. And I tried them. I ran around the block, and I was like, I'm so. He was like, no, no, no. Try them for a few weeks and a few months, and let me know. And I said, I said, yeah, well, start making me another pair because. <laughs> Because I had to pry that pair. He only had like two or three pair ever, you know. So he had to pry that pair out of his hands so I could run in them for a while. And he let me have them eventually, or that day he let me have them. And uh, I ran in them for two weeks, and I was like, I'm sold. Okay, I need a pair for Zane Gray, which was a couple of months after he first introduced those to me. And they had a really hard time finding a pair for me. Like, they only had 10, 10 or 10 pair in production, you know, the pair we were making them. But he caught a pair to me that were a half size too small which isn't necessarily good in an ultra, but I took the insoles out, I created a little bit more room and I ran them with, with them in Zane Gray. And, and Zane Gray, as I mentioned before, is super technical. And I ran against a guy named Scott Jaime, who's still out there running. And people looked at me like, what the, what are you wearing? You know, moon boots, clown shoes, we've heard that before. Um, but here I am with a 40 minute lead in the race, about 40 miles into it. And I was climbing over a dead tree and I, the branch broke and I fell back on my arm and I broke my arm. And it was pretty, I mean, my arm was a mess. We were all crooked in the mess and, and uh, I ended up dropping out of the race. I had, to, I had to walk four miles to the next aid station to drop out. And I was still leading the race after walking that far. And, uh, but, but I was like, if I fall on this thing again, I'm going to ruin my arm, you know? So I dropped out Scott went by and won the race and okay, game over. And then, but everyone thought, oh, Carl tripped on those moon boots, you know? <laughs> and it was like, no, no, no. I had to like go through explaining that story. Um, so I explained the story. Boulder Running Company picked them up. They got about seven. They, bought, they ordered 700 pair. This is the very, very beginning of Hoka. They ordered 700 pair, which was a lot for the for Nico and Jean and Jean Luc. A couple of local stores here in Salt Lake. I got those guys to order 50 pair each, and they sold out of those shoes before they were even in the store because of my rec because of my recommendation, you know. And the rest sort of is history as as Hoka as Jean Luc and Nico almost went under, and they sold the Deckers. Um, and that created more funds, of course, and uh, then the, the brand really started taking off. And that's when I, when I uh, introduced the Speed Goat shoe to Jim Van Dyne, who was then the president, about, um, about you know, signature shoe. And he was like, yep, let's do it. And that's, and again, like that's, I only run on trails. I mean, I have, I have other Hoka shoes. I have some Carbon X. I have a whole, whole line of Hoka shoes in my house. But generally, I run in the Hoka Speed Goats because that's the terrain that I train on, and that's the shoe for that terrain. Technical, tough terrain. They're soft. They fit my foot perfectly. Um, I mean, they didn't, they didn't mold my foot and make the shoe that way. We got to make it for everyone, right? But uh, I had a lot of input on the, the, the sole and the base, and the tread and the traction. Uh, Hoka helped me a little bit with the upper because I don't, I don't know the shoe designer. I just have recommendations. And uh, But yeah, that's, the long answer is that's the shoe that I'm running in now. And uh, will that ever change? I doubt it. I mean, I have, I've got a bit of a stockpile. <laughs> um, I love them, and I just love the response of the Vibram rubber on them. I love how they, I mean, they grip a, a wet rock. I mean, they're not going to grip moss or grease, you know. I mean, you know, it's a shoe, but um, they, to see people on the trails now, when I go run this afternoon, I guarantee you I'll see a couple people wearing speed goals. Guarantee. Every single day I go run, I see someone wearing them. Whether it's East Coast, Virginia, whether it's Utah, California, wherever, I see people wearing them, and that's like, I usually say, no, nice, nice shoes, you know, and they don't, they may or may not know me when that, they know me locally, but not, you know, California or something, but it's, it's an honor to have that. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, it's easily my favorite shoe and hopefully um, that'll continue until I'm, I'm not really running anymore. Yeah. Hoka, I just need to make a golf shoe now. <laughs> Hoka, I mean, they, they've gone so far in the past couple of years and you look at a shoe like the Speed Goat and it's, it's such a versatile shoe. It, it can really handle any trail you know i even use it from the road to the trail an amazing uh, ride to the shoe what would you say is the very best use for the speed go like what, i i know it does so many things really well but what would you say in your opinion is where that shoe excels the most well, well mostly i mean generally speaking technical terrain rocky technical terrain you know if you're if you're on something like the appalachian trail or anywhere on the east coast for that matter because there's humidity right so the rocks are more slippery it's, it's the Vibram rubber that is the real ticket to that. Um, the stickiness, uh, Vibram rubber, you know, they, it's their own brand. Like 
Hoka has to collaborate with Vibram somehow to put that Vibram rubber on the shoe. That's a massive, a massive help. They've tried other rubbers and it just doesn't work as well. But anything technical is really what you want. Something with you know, damp in the, like if, there's, if it's a rocky trail and you step on a sharp rock, you don't want to feel that rock. Well, in the hook, in the Spiegel, you probably won't feel it. You know, you, there's one little place you might step on that, oh, I, I felt it in my heel, but I can assure you that's one out of nine million steps that you take, you're going to feel that. The idea is to not feel the ground. That was the whole idea between Nico and Jean-Luc making that shoe initially in 2009 in their little factory in Annecy in France, um, was to not feel the ground. And these, you really, not, you're not going to feel the ground, but I don't believe you feel, you know, many people worry about the stack height being, well, they're too tall, I'm going to roll my ankle. That's a common, um, uh, you know, not problem, but it's a common uh, thing that people think that's going to happen. But you don't really, you're not really sitting on that whole stack height. You're actually sitting in the shoe a little bit. So you're not, you're not going to tip over in the shoe because it's soft. It sort of, it kind of uh, absorbs and dampens into the rock, you know? So it doesn't sound like this stiff boot, you know, like hiking boot that you would make your ankles or knees twist around. It sort of absorbs everything. And that was the whole idea is absorb it, grip it and rip it, you know? Um, let them, let them go. And they're, I mean, they're great for downhill. There's just enough cushion to, to dampen any rocks out, but not too much cushion to make you feel like you're, you're up on a stilt or something like that. And that's kind of the whole idea. And it has a little bit of a roll rock to it, just a little bit to kind of sort of that whole rocker concept is to make you sort of feel like you're propelling forward. The four millimeter drop is I think just about right for a trail shoe. I mean, every shoes are different, you know, um, and what you like is different, but four millimeter is pretty standard. Um, good amount of drop for a, for a trail shoe. I think, you know, so they, I mean, every time I run into things, I'm just like, man, these things are so comfortable. You know, they don't fit everybody. Some people say they're a little narrow, but they do make a wide now. So that's been corrected or, uh, or fixed, I guess. So it should fit just about everybody unless, you know, you're an anomaly, I guess. So they're great. Yeah, and when we talk about the Speed Go, it's really become one of my favorite shoes. I know a lot of people just absolutely love it. And you talked about, you know, some of your earlier running days. And even when we go back 10, 15 years, the trail shoe lineup out there from a lot of brands weren't really that impressive. And you, you go to today, and there's such amazing shoes. Um, so it's awesome to hear about the Speed Goat. Uh, another favorite of mine, the Evo Speed Goat, which was a, a little, a little more race day friendly, but that was an amazing shoe. And you know, I, I look forward to see what what's to come because you know Hoka really is just keep pushing the limits on on the trails and on the road. Yeah, and they didn't. You know, they they came when those when Jean Luc and Nico when Nico and Jean Luc came to the market, they were like, you know, it was all about the barefoot running. It was about the Vibram barefoot, and people were, you know, that was really important or or popular. And then all of a sudden they threw these things out there and they, you know, they didn't know what to expect really. And all of a sudden people realized that, wow, cushion's actually okay, you know? And now we're seeing a lot of the other brands follow Hoka, you know? Um, that's just the truth. I mean, you can't, no other brand can even hide from that and say, no, we did it our own way. Well, you didn't really do it your own way because you were following the, the minimalist, you know, New Balance 101 MTs, which were, they might have felt like your little foot and they might have been great for some things, but they're not good for a hundred mile or there's like, you know, there's nothing to it. So people started understanding that cushion isn't actually bad. And I think a lot of us, including myself, as we get older, you know, that cushion is actually quite nice. I'd rather have more cushion shoes than have, you know, fuel the ground and, you know, that kind of thing. It's just, it's amazing how other companies sort of follow that lead. And if you put it other, other companies trail shoes on the market now, they're not going to be thin soles. They're all kind of fatter. They're all got some grip. <laughs> um, Hoka really led, led the way out on this one. And I'm glad that they're really, uh, I'm glad they support me, number one. But number two, it's cool that they really stuck with their, their, their trail racing line. And they're also moving into, I mean, they move into track. They have an amazing track team. And uh, that's, you know, that's something that, sorry, I got to spin this off. Sorry about that. Um, it's amazing how they, they stuck with their, their brand and said, we, we still want the soft shoe. And they're making amazing track shoes now. They're making an amazing team. Naz, Naz Elite in Arizona. I mean, those girls are running 225 marathons and they're running their Hocus, you know. So there's, there's a reason they're good. If they're, you know, those track runners are running in them too, then they've definitely on to something. And uh, 
they really brought the brought it to the to the world in a really positive way. Yeah. Yeah, no, Hoka's making great product right now and, and it shows with their athletes' performances and you know, it's cool to hear the shoes and gear you're using. Um, but I want to move this forward. We reached out on social media and got some fan questions for you. So the first one we got, um, and I, I, I think maybe you, you touched on your, your broken arm, but maybe that's not the worst. The first question is, what's the worst running injury you've ever had uh, and how did you get over it? Uh, well, the broken arm was, was bad, but we won't, we've heard about that already. So that's, that's kind of, that wasn't really a running injury. I don't consider that a running injury. You know, I was climbing, I was, that was a climbing injury. <laughs> I was climbing over a dead tree. Um, but the worst running injury I think I've had or was accelerated by running was I had a bulging disc in my back and this was the year 2000. And I was, so in 1999, I went to hard rock. I dropped out the first year I ran 2000. I was like, Pegged to go run to win it. Got it uh, um, early June. Uh, my tune-up race for that was a Squat Peak 50 in Provo, Utah, and I was shoveling dirt. And I was so this isn't a running injury, but I was shoveling dirt, and I shoveled a little pile of dirt like I don't know four days before the race, which was stupid. I don't do those stupid things anymore. I've learned. <laughs> um, but I went to the race. My back didn't really feel right, but it didn't really hurt. I just sort of had to alter my stride a little bit, you know. But about eight miles into the race, uh, eight or 10 miles into the race, I was jumping over a dead tree or something like those damn dead trees again. <laughs> um, my back zinged. I was like, nah, you know, like one of those, like someone stabbing in the back, you know, and the pain went away and I kind of shuffled my way to the next day station, shuffled my way to the next one. And I was still actually leading the race at the time, but my back wasn't doing so well. When I got to the bottom of a, an area called Pole Heaven, about mile 22, I was like, I can't, I was sideways. I'm like, I can't, I'm out, you know? And I laid on the ground and I, I was worried about what was wrong. And I got home, I went to my doctor and Russ Toronto and uh, he did some tests on me and stuff like that. He's like, you have a bulging disc. And I was like, okay, well, he's like, it's not herniated, but it's just bulging. So it means it's kind of like just sticking out like your knuckle like that a little bit. So, I mean, extremely painful injury and you know, the running sort of accelerated it from shoveling that shoveling the dirt, turning and twisting is what basically started it. Then the running accelerated it into a bad injury. So my, my recovery from that um, is a pretty good story. So obviously it wasn't running, but I, I did some exercises my doctor told me to do. I had a shot of cortisone on my back pretty much about a week after it happened. Then I had another shot in my back two week, two more weeks after that. And, you know, some people don't necessarily like that either, but my doctor was always aggressive at getting me back onto the, onto the field, if you want to call it that. I took those shots five weeks after I had the initial injury. I, my doctor told me I could ride my bike as long as I turned my bar ends on my mountain bike up. So I set up real tall like this. So I started just walking, you know, riding around my bike a little bit and my back was getting a little better, you know, um, two more weeks later, I went for a little hike and I think that was enough. You know, I was like, eh, it's not so good, but I started running a little bit um and hiking and uh and then the funny thing is on august 11th then all of a sudden i was starting to run a little bit then all of a sudden i i kind of tweaked my facet joint in my back so then my back was hurt again in a different location and um then i didn't run for a while and i went to pt and pt girl and she kind of twisted me and turned me and i don't know if she did a heck of a lot but um I ran on a treadmill Wednesday. I was still registered for the Wasatch 100. So now we're talking it's early September. On the Wednesday before the Wasatch 100, I ran on a treadmill for 40 minutes. It was like, like the longest I think I've ever run on a treadmill up to this date even. <laughs> um, I started the race expecting to hopefully make it to mile 18 and probably drop out. I'm like, cool, I made it to 18. But as I ran the race, I got better, better and ended up winning the race. So I ran Wasatch in about 21 and a half hours after a bulging disc and a, and a, like a facet joint tweakage with the, like essentially no training all summer. So if you ever think you can come back from an injury off the couch, fully off the couch and, and do well, that was, that was the year that I, I came back from something that was horrifying. I mean, I, to this date, my back has never, for that injury has never hurt me again. And I honestly think, it sounds weird, but to think that I ran the race and I put it back in line, 
you know, I mean, I ran a hundred miles on a, on a weird, on a, I don't know what I had a bulging disc 12 weeks earlier or something like that. And I won the race and never heard again. Wow. That, that was a, again, it wasn't really a running injury, but at the same time, that's the worst injury that I've come back from and done well. And, and that was almost 20 years ago. Let, let's, let's fast forward to today. Um, the next question is, have you shifted your training and racing strategies as you've gotten older? Well, I'm a little slower now. So, you know, I mentioned efficiency earlier, so I try to be as most efficient as possible. Um, and that can only go so far at this point. But uh, I don't run as many miles now as I used to. Uh, and I think it's just all based on recovery. I can't recover as fast as if I run 15 miles this afternoon, I'm not going to feel bouncing. I won't be bouncing around tomorrow. You know, I'll run either really easy or I'll take the day off because I'm just not. I try to run when I feel fresher and I feel better. Um, as opposed to going out and just sucking it up and getting through the miles. I think recovery has is, is become more of, a, more of the training than the actual training is now. Um, I, de- I definitely do less miles, and that, that, that translates to probably slower times, a little bit over 100 miles. So we'll see how no business goes in four weeks. Um, I really have no idea how I'm going to do there. Uh, I'm just going to try to train in a couple more weeks and see how I do. But um, it, recovery has become more important as I've gotten older, more than anything. Yeah. All right, final question we got for you. Uh, the Speed Goat is my favorite shoe and has made some small but noticeable changes over the past few years. What do you think can be improved with the shoe to make it even better? Uh, that's, a tough one. <laughs> that's a tough one, right? So the two, three, and four are pretty similar. The one was very different. The two, three, and four are very similar. With the four, we tried to, so we came out with the Evo. So let's erase the Evo for a second, okay? Like that doesn't exist. Um, just think about the regular Speed Goats. But um, I think we, we went from the, the two and the three had a more cushioned, more cushioned uh, uh, upper tongue, we'll call it the tongue, whatever. And so now the four has a more streamlined tongue. I think we might, if it were me, I think I would go back, we'd go back to a little bit more cushioned um, in the laces area a little bit, because that's sometimes when, when people tie, them, tie their laces too tight, they, which it does is put pressure on the tendons on top of your foot. And a lot of people have foot pain on the top of your foot. So I think we could maybe tweak that a little bit. The sole, it, it, the four is a tiny bit softer than the three. You, you know, it's hard to, we're kind of going back to the three. I sort of think, I sort of like the three the best, honestly. Not, I mean, not by a lot, you know, but it's mostly because of that cushion um, in the tongue. I think we might go back a tiny, tiny bit stiffer on the five if we do a five. Um, but again, it's, I wouldn't tra- change the tread pattern. I think the tread pattern is perfect. I mean, the knobbies are, they're faced a certain way, so you can't, it's hard to slip out sideways and hard to slip out forward. They're made a certain way. So you, so that helps prevent that. I, I, I really have a hard time saying I wouldn't change anything. And even if I got paid a million dollars to make a five a million might be enough, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, um, I really don't want to change much because it's, Number one, they're doing a great job selling them. That means they're doing, the shoe is great, right? If they're selling a lot of shoes, they're doing fine. People are re- buying multiple pairs at a time because they like that certain version. Um, I really, I don't want them to change too much other than maybe a little cushion in the, in the uh, top of the foot a little bit. But, you know, we made it wide. So we've accommodated those people that were worried about how wide they are. Uh, with the Evo, the Evo, I mean, you know, step back to the Evo now, that other... Uh, model of the speed goat um, that's just really streamlined streamlined for racing a little bit um, and again that shoe too could have a tiny bit of cushion on the top of the foot because I think that's just a place where when you lace your shoes down I've seen it with my clients it's like oh the top of my foot or top of my foot hurts so I have a stress fracture I said well I loosening your laces and amazingly boom it's gone you know and that's I've had that injury before so I knew it you know but uh it's, it's hard to change something. It ain't broke, don't fix it. That's always been sort of my motto too. And I think Hoka should really stick with at least a very, very close similar um, design to what we have. And, you know, maybe we'll tweak something in, in, uh, in the prototypes um, that we can't really talk about. But uh, it's, like I said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I really don't want them to change too much at all, other than that tongue. Yeah, I I'd agree, and I mean, it has become such a favorite of mine that I, I don't know if much needs to be changed. I think moving forward, when we start talking about maybe 
new Evos. You know, there's obviously on the road running scene, there's these new midsole foams, there's carbon fiber plates. So is there a potential of something like that coming into the market? Maybe, but for, uh, for the, the actual standard speed goat, uh, I think you're right, not too much really needs to be changed because it has been kind of so fine tuned that uh, it, it's so good for so many runners. I mean, I mean, the carbon fiber plate is like a whole new step forward. Like we saw that with Nike with their Vaporfly thing and, and how popular that became for a road shoe. Uh, the carbon fiber plate is interesting. It's funny because I was talking about a carbon fiber plate in early 2000s. Um, I'm not kidding you. I mean, I didn't know, again, I wasn't a shoe designer, right? But I'm like, man, carbon fiber plate, walk out. I was thinking more like walk out the rocks being really thin. The carbon fiber, you really can't, it's not like this flexible thing. You can't just flex it. It's, it's, it's a weird uh, composite, you know? So to put it in a, in a, in a road shoe, there was, I don't, I don't know how they even did it. I don't even know. To put it in a trail shoe, I don't think it's been done. Um, but if that d does happen, and I don't know, I honestly don't know if that will happen or not, but um, that will be gone through a lot of prototypes to see how that works, because I don't know if that will work or not, you know. It might make it, it might make it just non-responsive. It may, may make it too responsive. It's hard saying. Uh, but I mean, I thought about that a long, long time ago. And my buddy who worked at Black Diamond, he's like, well, you can't twist or turn it. It would never work for a shoe. Well, it's in a shoe now. <laughs> So who knows, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not the lead designer. Um, it's just kind of my input and I, I help with the input, but that's really as far as I can go. And then, and whatever comes out of the, out of the mold is, is what comes out of the mold, you know? Yeah. We're, we're going to have to just wait and see what comes. I know Hoka is always kind of pushing the boundaries and with carbon fiber plates, you know, we are st seeing so many new types and added flexibilities and lighter weight. So, I think, you know, the future uh, is looking bright and, you know, we're just gonna have to wait and see, but, you know, that's, that's to come. We, we can't really think too much about it right now, but um, for people who want to stay, you know, in touch with you, you've got all these races uh, that you've done and coming up, FKT attempts, uh, where can they find you on social media? Well, on social media, Facebook, obviously, um, Carl Meltzer. Um, I have a, you know, an athlete page too. You can just like that. Then you catch anything that I put on there. Um, Instagram, again, I don't carry my phone when I run, so I'm not really a photo guy. I'm on Instagram, but you won't see too many photos. Uh, Twitter, uh, my handle is uh, at Speedgo Carl. Um, so you can find me there. And that's kind of, and my email is Speedgo Carl at Gmail. You can, you know, I'll always take questions for anybody you know, I coach and I consult and all that kind of thing, but never hesitate to email me and say, Hey, Carl, I got a question about something. I'm not going to say pay me 50 bucks and we'll talk. It's I'm not like that. I'm, I'm rather help people um, get better at what they do. So feel free to reach out, but carlmeltzer.com, my website too. You can also connect with coaching there. You can connect on Spigo 50k race there. And then just, you know, you can send an inquiry, me, inquiry to me um, just on that page too. You can see right on the coaching services page. So, I'm, I'm reachable, you know, um, Facebook messenger. I mean, I'm old, so I see Facebook, you know, <laughs> um, I'm not on Snapchat or, or I think there's some called TikTok too. I don't know. So, you know, um, I'm available for anyone out there who wants to reach out. You just kind of have to Google it and don't forget to Google the moose story because it's classic. If you haven't heard it. Definitely. I'll, I'll have to check that one out myself. And, you know, it, it's great to hear your full story. You know, you've been around in the ultra world for so long and, like I said, we've had on Courtney Dewalter, Jeff Browning recently, and I didn't think we could really up the ante anymore, but, you know, we finally, <laughs> we had you on, and, you know, it's been an honor. Well, those two, those two are pretty solid right there. What Courtney's done has been amazing. What Jeff has, Jeff and I are good friends, and he's the second winningest 100-mile runner on earth, and I think he has 22. He's, I think he's tied with Dan Tracy at 22. So and this was a bad year to go for it, right? But, uh Jeff is an outstanding athlete, a great coach. Courtney, I, I think she coaches too. Um, you know, reach out to people that have some experience in the field of actual running the ultras. I think that is important. Um, but yeah, there, those two are, I mean, you know, there aren't too many people to be on top of that. I mean, Scott Jurek is great. Scott is a friend of mine too. You could reach out to him. But uh, it's cool to hear um, that I'm still, people still listen to what I have to say. <laughs> Um, and I'm glad that people respect it and, uh, you know, just keep running on and, uh, you know, have fun out there. That's what's most important. Yeah. 
no, you really are an ultra marathon legend. I, I know so many people look up to you and, you know, once again, we thank you for coming on the show. It's been an honor. So until next time, that was the Running Warehouse Connection.